also when we just scan your barcodes again. So I welcome everyone, everyone of you on behalf of UPI. Uh, get going straight away. Uh, I'll ask Madam Professor Evanthi to start the work. Thank you. She is a board certified medical oncologist. I um, actually introduced myself. It's a small group. So I think most of all you will be, will be knowing me, but um, I just relocated a year and a half back from uh, US. I was in New York before that in uh, Boston. And uh, I practice all of solid tumors. Um, my special interest has been in translational um, oncology, as in I've done um, some genomic work, some um, uh, bench to bedside work um, at Harvard as well as at Columbia, where I was a faculty in the last seven, eight years. Um, after having come here, I've witnessed uh, one of the biggest revolutions happening uh, in India up close and personal and uh, the best part of it was that I had lived this in the US most recently. So I've seen the transformation happening over the last decade there and I see that happening here now. And it's actually quite inspiring and I feel that um, uh, uh, unlike the naysayers, unlike the people who don't believe in um, personalized therapy or, or, or they feel that it's a cliche, um, I actually feel that this is the future. This is the this is the present, and this is the future. Because how else do you uh, do treatment? It, it is just about doing the right thing. There is no other explanation to personalizing therapy. It's just doing the right thing for the patient. How can you say it's a wrong concept? So I very much am a believer and an optimist as well. And uh, I'll bring you into the. Uh, context of uh, cancer care and where the numbers really stand out are that this is a reality. One in every two men and one in every three women will be touched by this disease in their lifetime. And that's the reality that I go by. That's how important it is, not just for me, but for everyone. Everyone sitting in here and everyone outside everyone in this world should be aware of this reality and wake up to the call of uh, cancer and cancer therapy. So personalized therapy, as I said, and this is not a definition uh, put down by me, this is the generic definition. All thought leaders in personalizing therapy is just the right treatment for the right patient at the right time, every time. It shouldn't be that I give treatment to one patient and the results are different and then you give treatment to the other patient and the results are different. It shouldn't be like that. There should be a way to tell how each patient is going to do the treatment. And we don't have that way yet, but that's the concept that we are trying to follow. And like I said, it's not a new concept, it's an old concept. I, as a treating oncologist, when I give blood transfusion to a patient, that's personalizing. When I go and talk to them about their side effects after each cycle of chemotherapy, that's personalizing. So for me, that concept is very genuine. It is the right thing to do for the patient. It's just we have to roll up our sleeves and do it the right way so that we help advances in that direction. One of the earliest personalizing uh, therapy was tamoxifen for breast cancer, where you targeted the uh, endocrine receptor, the estrogen uh, and progesterone receptor. The concept came about in a bigger way when it was understood that chronic myeloid leukemia was being driven by this particular translocation, and it brought about the biggest uh, tsunami in oncology cancer medicine. I witnessed a part of this revolution because it happened in 2000s and in early 2000s when I started my fellowship in the US, uh, Dr. Rockefeller, Ro Rockefeller University is a big university with uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, it's a research center, it's right across uh, Sloan 
Dr. Rockefeller is born in 2009. None of us wanted to do lung cancer. None of us wanted to go into lung cancer because all our patients would die. Because then, late stage, and in the US, you, you become a super specialist. You're not just a medical oncologist. You then do either solid tumor. If you stay in academia, you do either solid tumor, then you then uh, you know, choose your branch, you choose your area of research. And so it was being contemplated whether or not uh, one would consider doing lung or you know head and neck and stuff like that. And nobody wanted to do lung. And now I can say with full authority that actually lung leads precision oncology. Lung cancer is the leader in conveying the message of precision oncology. And this is actually an older slide that I've used for a very long time. It's changed a lot. But the message stays that earlier it was just small cell, non-small cell, and here we are. And a lot of these have treatment implications. I'm going to show you in the last few slides of my own patients where treatments change. And this is just a slide of a patient who had adenocarcinoma lung, EGFR mutated. Entire lung is consumed with the disease. Within a couple of weeks of treatment, the lung opens up. We see this every day in our practices. In India, even more uh, start and right in our face because 20 to 30 percent of adenocarcinomas will turn out to be EGFR positive. Just the other day, a patient of mine. Uh, a patient came in with metastatic disease, bony mess, disease everywhere, disease looking very aggressive, adenocarcinoma. I was traveling to ASCO that day. We decided to do chemotherapy while waiting for the EGFR status. I decided to do chemotherapy as soon as I get back. So five days and we had the chemo center booked and everything. I got a message on WhatsApp from his son, Dad's not doing well, I'm admitting him at Tata. While I was away, five days I was away. In the midst of that, I get a message, admitting him at Tata, because he had started the initial work up at Tata. Three days later, I'm already back, I get a message, he's EGFR positive. And to me, that's like hitting a jackpot. You've gotten a lottery. That's how it's starkly different. The survival is starkly different. The morbidity is much lesser. These patients do so, so well. Similar story, another patient of mine who's been now on an EGFR inhibitor for the last nine months, presented with some more shortness of breath and some discomfort on the right side. PET scan shows slight disease progression. What do we do? We look for resistant mutations. So I'm still checking, I don't have an answer yet, but we all know that one of the largest areas of resistance is reflected in T790N. And as, to, as a treating clinician, one would check for that. We have a drug being launched in the next couple of months. I have used that drug for the last several years on, on clinical trials as well as compassionate use in the US. The drug is getting launched here now. And that's directly applicable to the T790M patient. Another uh, magic I saw in oncology was in ALK inhibition. So this is when I had already become a faculty, a junior faculty, I go in 2009, one of the first trials being run in phase one center. Uh, I was a phase one faculty at Dana Farber Cancer Center. And there was magic that we saw happening right in front of our eyes. The patient who had aggressive disease had gone through multiple lines of chemotherapy, metastatic lung cancer patient not responding to three lines of therapy, disease raging ahead responded to a pill. It was found to have ALK rearrangement, responded to crizotinib, and here this PET scan just illustrates that. You see all the disease here, 
and all the disease almost gone, but also to pick up to give us critical genomic information. And that is still being worked at. I have um, utilized it in some ways uh, for certain patients, but not in full clinical use right now. But this is the thing of the, the near future is going to happen. It's already happening in the West. And the concept of targeted therapy being superior to chemotherapy, uh, it's a concept that I practice every day. But there is a reality to that. Not every mutation is EGFR or ALK. And that's where we need to wake up and understand that many a times the mutation rates are going to be very, very low. One of the trials that is leading this, it, it's one of the most ambitious studies. I, was, uh, I had the honor of writing one of the arms of uh, NCI math study. It has 24 arms. When we were uh, initially designing it, it just had 10 arms. I wrote the arm B. And it's one of the most ambitious studies trying to make a reality out of this targeted therapy concept where you would want to look at the mutations that could be target targetable and then have drugs available to target these mutations. If you look at the mutation rates, druggable mutations rates that have been shown in the interim analysis of NCI MAX study, they're just 10%. Their goal is to capture 24% of mutations in 6,000 patients that they're going to screen. But they've just come out with 10%. So if you ask me for today's reality, when we do the genomic testing, I feel we are probably just addressing 10%. Capturing 10%, treating 10%, if we are diligent, we get lucky. Even then, not every mutation means the same. This is BRAF in melanoma. When you look at the responses, significant responses. BRAF in thyroid and non-small cell lung cancer, still good response. But colorectal BRAF, minimal response. So not every mutation will behave in the same way when you use an inhibitor the context of the disease is also important this is a HER2 positive patient treated with Herceptin we know this concept breast cancer HER2 positive breast cancer patient neoadjuvant chemotherapy complete response no disease left this is a patient with HER2 mutation, not HER2 amplification. This is a patient of mine who presented with a brain lesion. HER2 mutant disease can be treated with a fat net. There is enough left literature to, to support that. The patient was treated with HER2 um, directed therapy with, with a fat net, had a disease control of seven months. I don't have a follow-up imaging. Disease control of seven months after an SBRT to the to the brain, and then so her clock for metastatic lung cancer started after seven months of therapy with a fat nail. That's when her chemotherapy started. She got seven months extra. This is a head and neck patient with recurrent disease. Multiple multiple salvage surgeries later, found to have. On, on, on a short hotspot panel testing her to uh, amplification after therapy. Just two cycles down, significant response. And then a talk about tumor microenvironment and tumor heterogeneity brings me to the cancer moonshot study where we saw the development of significant numbers of immune therapy drugs to the extent that one of the experimental therapeutic walls in ASCO just has immune therapy drugs enlisted. The entire wall is full of the drugs that have already come and the drugs that are coming. And this mainly moved the immunotherapy in melanoma, moved the survival curve up from here to here, 